All right, open your Bibles with me, if you would, to James chapter 4. I'm going to give that a go, see if you can fiddle with it. All right, come with me to James chapter 4. If you can give me my next slide, Liv, that would be great. James chapter 4, and what we'll do the week after next, we'll do all of James 5 in a single presentation. Up to this point, we've been dividing the, ser- the, the chapters into basically two parts, but that final part will just be one chapter, chapter 5. So, our sermon today is titled, Vapor, Shadow, Grass, Flower, and Smoke. Vapor, Shadow, Grass, Flower, and Smoke. And uh, we're going to be in James chapter 4, beginning at about verse 11. So, let's go there. We're going to read verse 11 all the way to verse 17. So, not a lot of verses today, only eight verses, but there's going to be two primary points that we're going to be driving at and that James is driving at. And I think you're going to really like this today. It's going to really speak to your heart. It's been speaking to my heart as I've been studying. So we're in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. James says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy Who are you to judge another? Verse 13, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. And then the final verse of chapter 4, therefore to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what, everyone? To him it is sin. We're going to see in in the latter part here of James chapter 4, James is going to make two primary points, and both of those points are going to have big implications for how we think about God, how we think about God's relationship to the world, and how we think about ourselves and our own relationship to the world We're transitioning out of James chapter 4, the first part, where we find James saying things like this. He's quoting here from Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verse 34, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And the next verse, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and God will lift you up. So as we come out of the first part of James chapter 4, we have this really strong push here. James is saying, humble yourself. God resists the proud, but He draws near to the humble. And there are going to be two specific ways. Next slide, if you would. There's going to be two specific ways that people can vaunt themselves or elevate themselves over and against God and His ways that we just read in James chapter 4, verses 11 to 17. The slide before that, please. Thank you. Two proud ways. Number one, James says, is in judgment of others. And then the second is in godless planning and in money making. Is it working? Kind of. Okay, that's just what I like. Great. There we go. So, notice verse 11. Notice verse 11. Let's start by judgment of others. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother judges the law. Now, let's read this in several different translations so you get a feel for the sort of breadth of this word, do not speak against a brother. It's a big word, and it's a big Greek word that can take on different shades and nuances of meaning. So, I'm going to quote several passages here, several translations rather, to give you a feel for this passage. The New Living Translation says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. Okay? The contemporary English Bible says, brothers and sisters, don't say evil things about each other. Whoever insults or criticizes a brother or sister insults and criticizes the law. So you're beginning to get a feel for the breadth of this term here, speaking against, to criticize, to to condemn, to judge. Uh, From the contemporary English version, my friends, don't say cruel things about others. If you do, if you condemn others, you are actually condemning others. God's law. And I think I've got one more up here as well. The NIV. Brothers and sisters, do not, what's that word, everyone? Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. Here we see James's ethical Christianity on full display. This is not a mere theological exploration. This is don't be cruel to people with your words. 
It was last week or the week before that Pastor Joel talked to us about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And Pastor Joel made the, the insightful observation that that is not true at all. Nothing pierces the soul like cruel words, criticizing words, judgmental words, or insulting words. And James here, he says, look, one of the ways that you cannot behave in a humble manner is to speak ill of others, to talk about others, to insult others, to criticize others. But what James says, the reasoning behind this is actually quite fascinating. It's very different probably than the reasoning that you and I would give to our child, right? We might say to our son or to our daughter, now, little Johnny or little Landon or little Jabel or little Mary, it's not nice to speak ill about other people. That's not nice, right? We would sort of have this, this sort of, you know, sort of generic be nice to people thing. But what James says is really interesting. James doesn't say, don't judge, it's not nice. He says, don't judge because when you judge, you're judging the law. That's an interesting motivation to not speak in an insulting or critical way of other people. Don't be critical of others because in being critical of others, you're being critical of the law. Don't judge others because in judging others, you're judging the law. Don't insult others because in insulting others, you're insulting the law. Just how does this, this argument work? If I'm speaking critically or judgmentally uh, or insultingly about a person, how am I speaking insultingly or judgmentally or critically about the law? It, it doesn't quite add up. But in fact, it does when we take into consideration the fact that so much of, of James's teaching is rooted in the ethical behavior of the Old Testament. Right? We have mentioned again and again in this series that, that James is very much like an Old Testament prophet. Right? There's, there's a lot Old Testament in the book of James. In fact, one of the critiques about the book of James from some of the early church fathers was it doesn't talk enough about Jesus. The word Jesus, the name Jesus, only occurs two times in the entire book, all five chapters. Jesus by name is mentioned just twice. And people felt, some early church fathers felt, that the, the book wasn't grace-filled enough. It wasn't Jesus-filled enough. It was, it was so Old Testament. It was so ethical, so practical that some actually argued that the book should not be included in the canon of Scripture. But if we allow James to say what he's saying, remember, this is early Christianity. This is primitive Christianity. We're talking A.D. 40 here, A.D. 50. Early on in the piece, James still very much identifying as a Jew. James, as a Jew, speaking to Jews in a Jewish context, in a Jewish situation, has as his backdrop the Jewish law. And so he doesn't say, don't be critical, don't be mean, don't be insulting, because that's not nice. What he says is, don't be critical, don't be mean, don't be insulting, because when you do that, you're actually judging the law. Now, when he says law, you might be programmed as a Seventh-day Adventist, if you're here a Seventh-day Adventist today, if you're not, and you're a visitor, welcome. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, you're probably programmed, when you see the word law, to think Ten Commandments. But I got some bad news for you here. It's actually not bad news, because it's biblical news, but you might perceive it as bad news. When the New Testament uses the word law, it basically never means the Ten Commandments. Never, right? When the New Testament uses the word law, it means the Torah. It means the Old Testament, and perhaps more specifically, the writings of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So he's not saying, if you're critical of someone, you stand in judgment of the Ten Commandments. What he's saying is, if you're critical or judgmental of someone, you stand in judgment on Torah. You stand in judgment on the whole essence of the Old Testament. Now look at this, right from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. This passage has already been quoted by James in his book, back in chapter 2. And this is the essence of the Old Testament. This is the essence of Torah. It's the essence of the basic ethical posture of the Jewish religion. And it is here, 1918 of Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor. What are the next two words, everyone? As yourself. I am the Lord. If that's not a practical, ethical statement, there is no such thing. Jesus himself would say that all the law and the prophets hang on this one axiomatic truism. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul would say the same thing. Jesus and Paul, as the two greatest teachers in the New Testament, distilled the essence of the ethical teaching of the Old Testament down to this one simple idea. Love your neighbor as yourself. And James does the same. James quotes this. In fact, I'll put it up here on the screen for you. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We've already been through this. James says, if you fulfill, and what does he call it? What are, the, what are those three words there? 
Oh, I like that. The royal law. Who gives a royal law? Royalty, right? This is the kingly law. This is God's own law. This isn't some regional ordinance or, or some state law. No, no, no. James says if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, and here it is. Say it with me. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. So the the backdrop for James as he's writing and saying, if you're mean, if you're critical, if you're insulting to another person, you stand in judgment on the law. James has as his backdrop the idea that the whole essence of of the Jewish ethic and the whole essence of Torah boils down to this one basic idea, do to others what you would want them to do to you. So if you opt not to do that, Right? Because you don't like it when people gossip about you. You don't like it when people speak insultingly about you. You don't like it when people, as, as uh, Joel said, I thought it was really good, looking fresh and acting salty. You don't like it when you're on the receiving end of that. And James says, if you don't like it when it's done to you, then don't do it to somebody else. And if you decide to do that, then you are standing in judgment on the law and saying, God's law is not best. I can, I can come up with a better way. A better way is to, when circumstances suit, to be insulting, to be judgmental, to be unkind, to speak against somebody. And so it's fascinating James's logic here. He doesn't say, hey, don't do that. That's not nice. He says, don't treat people this way because when you do, you're actually standing in judgment of the royal law that says to do unto others as you would want them to do to you. Not only are you standing in judgment of the law, what James says next in verse 12 is astonishing. He says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Not only when we decide to speak ill of others and to criticize others and to be, to be uh, uh, harsh toward other people with our speech, not only are we standing in judgment of the royal law, we are standing in judgment of the royal lawgiver. And this is great. Right at the center of this, this question that he asks Who are you to judge? Who are you to judge? And then he says, there is one lawgiver. You are not the lawgiver. Neither am I. You you and I are the law receivers. We receive the law that was handed to us uh, from God at Sinai transmitted through Moses and then down through the Scriptures. We receive the law. We do not give the law. We do not administrate the law. And all of this, this idea that there is one lawgiver, really has contained in it, embryonically, what Jews regard as the single most important theological text in the entire Old Testament. We've dealt with this here before. It's called the Shema. And Shema comes from the word there, listen, hear. That word is Shema. It's the listen. Listen. It's the listen up. It's the hear, O Israel. And it is Yahweh, our Elohim. Yahweh is one. This is referred to as the Shema by Jews today. It is is the most holy of all of the texts in the Old Testament. And of course, uh, traditional Jews, Orthodox Jews hold the Old Testament in very high regard. But no text is more preeminent. No text is more important. No text is more essential to the ethos of Judaism than this text. Hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. And so when James says in verse 12, who are you? There is only one Yahweh. The Shema is the backdrop here for the text. There is only one lawgiver. Who are you? When we opt to speak critically of another person, to be judgmental of another person. What we are effectively doing is not only standing in judgment on the law and saying, I have a higher standard, I have a better standard, I have a more virtuous or ethical standard. Not only are we doing that, we are actually in some sense dethroning the lawgiver. James's question is, on what grounds, on what basis, on what bedrock Do you consider yourself someone who is able to accurately judge another human being? Do you know all the circumstances of that human being's life? Do you know every detail of their child, of their rearing, of their childhood? Do you know every one of their chromosomes, their DNA? Do you know the genetical and epigenetical and the the, uh, environmental factors that have created and turned that person into the unique person that they are? And God would say to us, no, you do not. 
What you do know is that you overheard a conversation. What you do know is that you had a very small snippet of information that was either fed to you or that you yourself might have witnessed. What you do have is a very thin strip of evidence, and on that thin strip of evidence, you are now speaking critically, judgmentally, insultingly about them. And James's point is when you do that, you are effectively taking God off of the throne and saying, I've got a better law, and I can be a better judge, and you sit down as the lawgiver. So it's not just don't do that because it's not nice. It's don't do that because you're not God. You are not in possession of all of the factors that contribute to the decisions, both good and bad, that other people make. Just this week, I had a situation that I cannot go into detail on, but in that situation, there was a circumstance that looked really clear-cut. It looked really simple. It looked, it looked like it was open-and-shut case. But me, being in the unique situation that I was in in this circumstance, knew that there was a context, knew that there was a story, knew that there was a backdrop. And God is like that. God sees, yeah, I see what you see. I see what you heard. I see your evaluation. But trust me, you don't know the whole story. God knows the whole story. And God is therefore uniquely and and wonderfully capable of evaluating every person, every decision, every circumstance, every word in light of all of those genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors that that are unavailable to us. So James's point is a point that we really need to take on board here. Be humble, James says, and don't speak ill of one another. James's concern in the historical context was that these, these scattered tribes had begun to behave in ways that were, that were actually hostile to one another. He says, hey, I see how you're talking about one another. I see how you're behaving to one another. Don't do that. You don't have a higher virtuous standard or a higher ethical standard than God's law to do unto others as you would have them do unto you to love your neighbor as yourself. And you don't want to take God off the throne. And so in a single question, in three syllables and three words, James puts his finger on the pulse of the futility of us trying to judge others. Who are you? And the answer, of course, is you're a sinner. You're a sinner similarly in need of a Savior. Can somebody say amen? In this situation that I was just describing a month ago or a moment ago that I cannot go into all the details on, uh, when the situation was open and shut, I advised this particular person, when somebody questions you about this, all you have to say is, I made a bad decision. I said to them that guilt and shame are like mushrooms, they, 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 in the darkness is where they, where they prosper. In the darkness is where they proliferate. In the darkness is where they grow. And so what happens with us is we think, oh, no one can know that I made a bad choice. No one can know that I did something that was embarrassing. No one can know this. And so we protect, and that protectionism actually increases our guilt and shame. And we're nervous for anybody to find out that we actually need a Savior. But, but a really amazing thing happens, and not just amazing, but a liberating thing happens. If somebody says, hey, I heard that you were a sinner, and you say, I am a sinner. Hey, I heard that you made a really bad choice. If you take ownership of it and say, yeah, I, I made a bad choice. I shouldn't have done that. I behaved badly. I talked unkindly. I lied. I cheated. If, if, when you do that, a really amazing thing happens. You, you feel better. You say, yeah, 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 I, I, I am a bad person. I did make a bad choice. I do need a Savior. But when we try to protect and we try to put on that we're really not someone that's in need of a Savior, our shame increases like mushrooms. It grows in the darkness. But when you throw open the door and say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and in a specific instance, a specific situation, maybe you did make a really bad choice. Own it. Just say, yeah, I, 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 I was in a situation. People were talking badly about somebody, and I joined in, and I began to say things that I now regret. It was stupid. I should have never done that. Right? I deal with young people that do really stupid things. And a, and a high percentage of those really stupid things that they do revolve around their phones. Right? Like, yeah, I really did a stupid thing. I really shouldn't have done that. I wish I hadn't done that. Just take ownership of it. Just a really awesome thing happens. When you own your shame, when you own your guilt, when you cease to be what Ty Gibson called several months ago, vulnerophobic, just be vulnerable. You just are liberated. It's okay to say, yeah, I did that. It was really stupid. I wish I hadn't done it. 
And oh, my friends, when, when we behave in this way, it suddenly puts us in a posture toward those around us that are sinners. We don't see judgmentalism. We don't see us looking down on them. We see us looking across at them. How can I embrace a brother who's hurting? How can I embrace a sister who's made a bad choice? How can I reach out to somebody who's in the same situation that I am? I'm not God on the throne replacing the royal law. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. James says, don't talk like that about one another. Don't be insulting. Don't speak against one another. You don't want to replace the royal law, and you don't want to take God off His throne. Paul deals with this very same thing in Romans chapter 14. Notice what he says, the very same idea here, because this is not something that is uniquely churchy, by the way. I hear people say, oh, the church is so judgmental. Human beings are judgmental. Okay, it's not a church thing. The church does not have some proprietary access to hypocrisy, judgmentalism, and unkindness. People are hypocritical, people are judgmental, and people are unkind. Can somebody say amen? It happens in the local footy club, it happens at the local bank, it happens in the local surf riders club. It just happens. Wherever you get a group of human beings together, it's, lar- it's possible that someone is going to be offended and someone is going to offend. So people say, oh, I'm done with the church. I'm, there's a bunch of hypocrites in there, a bunch of critical people in there. Okay, where are you going to go? Have you found some utopia? Have you found some place where you can go where everybody treats people exactly the same? Have you, you haven't found it. What the church is and what the church is supposed to be is a bunch of people who say, we know we're broken, we know we need a Savior, and we're all here, not because one of us is better than another, and certainly not because we're better than the community out there, but because we're simply saying, we're great sinners and Jesus is a great Savior. And so Paul says, why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? As it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account, what are the next two words? Of himself or of herself to God. This is great news. I don't have to give an account for Judith. God is not going to ask me why Judith Halmai did what she did. God is not going to ask me why Josh Prince did what he did. God is going to say, why did you do what you did? Why did you say what you said? Why did you act how you acted? Why did you gossip the way that you gossiped? Why did you lie the way that you lied? And I'm so happy to tell you, I'm so happy to tell you, it's the judgment seat of Christ, and Christ is not only judge, he's also Savior. Can someone say amen? You don't have to give an account for David Ashrick, and I don't have to give an account for you. Paul's point, similar to James, not identical, but similar, is, look, just let the judgment sort itself out. God is uniquely qualified to judge. He continues, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. Let's put away that foolishness. Let's stop taking God off of the throne, but rather resolve this. If you're going to make a personal resolution, resolve this, Paul says, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. If you're going to make a resolution, don't make a resolution to be a jerk, Don't make a resolution to be judgmental. Make a resolution to try and help others out, to try and be a blessing. And Paul goes on to make the very same point that James makes and the very same point that Moses makes and the very same point that Jesus makes. If your brother is grieved, if your brother is hurt, if your brother or sister is injured, you are no longer walking in, what is it? Love. So for James, as for Jesus, as for Paul, as for Moses, it all boils down to this single ethical axiom. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who are you? The text says. Judgment of others in some sense actually dethrones God and replaces the law. Now, we need to say a word on this. Some of us might overhear what I'm saying. Someone might say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Does that mean that we turn our brains off? Does that mean that we stop analyzing and evaluating and critiquing the prevailing culture? No, it does not. If you notice, in each of these cases, he says, why do you judge your brother? Paul is talking in-house, inside of the church. Not Paul, nor Jesus, and certainly not James, is telling us to cease your evaluation and your critique, legitimate critique of the prevailing worldly culture. No, we're not being asked to turn our brains off. What What we're being asked to do is to turn our hearts on. Okay, these are not mutually exclusive. You can have both your brain on and your heart on at the same time. Notice how Douglas Moo deals with this. James is not prohibiting the proper and necessary discrimination. I would have preferred the word discernment. James is not prohibiting the proper and necessary discernment 
that every Christian should exercise, nor is He forbidding the right of the community to exclude from its fellowship those it deems to be in flagrant disobedience to the standards of faith or to determine right and wrong among its members. James rebukes jealous, censorious speech by which we condemn others as being wrong in the sight of God. What he's saying here is not, don't be critical, don't be analytical, don't be evaluative. Don't turn your brain off to such a degree that you say that everything is good. In fact, there are are strong critiques in the Old Testament that say, when you call bad good, God says, how can you discern between right and wrong? No, we can still stand and say, look, that's bad behavior. But the next step is to say, that's a bad person. Do you see the difference? It's one thing to say, that behavior is unscriptural. That attitude is unbiblical. It's a totally different thing to say, that's a bad person. That's a lost person. Now, we don't know that. I've had people say to me with a straight face, oh, she's lost. As if they are in full possession of all of the factors that would contribute to somebody's being judged. You are not in possession of that. This is why we should never say, so-and-so is lost, so-and-so is unsaved. Maybe that is the case, but you are not in possession of the evidence that would acquire you to make a fair... All you're making is 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 a subjective judgment about what you perceive to be the situation. So while we can evaluate behaviors, we can evaluate attitudes, we can evaluate cultures and say... That's sinful, that's condemned in Scripture. That, what we can't do is make that next step and say all the people who do those things, all the people that practice those things, all the people that live in that town, they're all sinners going to hell. You can't make that step. You cannot make that step. Don't have such an open mind that your brain falls out. Nothing wrong with having an open mind. And what James is not saying here is don't be evaluative, don't be analytical. In fact, Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 24, stop judging by mere appearances. He doesn't say stop judging, period. What he says is stop judging on mere appearances. And then what he says next is fascinating. But instead, judge correctly. Question, according to Jesus, is there a correct kind of judgment, yes or no? Of course there is. But it's not a judgment that consigns someone to condemnation or consigns them to, to hell or consigns them to being lost. Correct judgment evaluates attitudes, including your own, behaviors, including and especially your own, culture, including and especially your own culture. And there is nothing at all wrong with taking a good look at the world and saying the world is fundamentally broken. Just this last week, as you would be aware, Australia voted nearly two to one to be in favor of same-sex marriage. Some Christians on one side of the aisle are scandalized by this decision. They say, man, this is proof positive that, that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Others stand on the other side of the aisle and say, no, 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 no. This is just the kind of magnanimity and equality and egalitarianism that the, the, the society has been striving towards since the medieval period. And wherever you personally come down on that, whether you favor the religious liberty side and say, well, look, these people aren't Bible-believing Christians, we shouldn't impose our religious construct upon them. Maybe you're on that side of the aisle, or maybe you're on this side of the aisle where you say, well, no, wait a minute, the family unit is biologically sacred, and it is institutionally sacred, and it should be protected. Here's the point. What you cannot do on either side of the aisle is color everybody else on the other side of the aisle with the same brush. It, it, It doesn't work that way. This is a nuanced issue. It's an issue in which culture is running headlong into a brave new world. Frankly, they don't know where they're going. I mean, and you can't blame them. People who are not rooted in Scripture, people who have lost the moral moorings of the basic identity of gender, right? Where are you running? We don't know, but we're going very fast. Right? We can critique a direction that is unbiblical. We can evaluate decisions that are farcical and contrary to basic nature and biology. Yes, we can do that. What we cannot do is say that all of the people who adhere to that perspective, all of the people who are are sympathetic to that perspective are summarily lost, are summarily wicked, are summarily evil, are summarily delinquent. We cannot say that. You can do the first, not the second. Jesus says, don't judge by appearances, just judge correctly. Yes, have an open mind, but not so open that your brain tips out. Can you say amen? This is a great opportunity for the church to practice what it preaches when it comes to evaluating culture and not condemning individual people. 
Can we critique the prevailing culture? Of course we can. We would be delinquent in our responsibilities if we didn't critique the prevailing culture. The prophets critiqued the prevailing culture. The disciples pr pr uh, critiqued the prevailing culture. Jesus cr cr critiqued the prevailing culture. I'll, I'll say this. I've not said this publicly. I've said it in a few private conversations. I got, I, got, I got news for you. The church always did best when it was a politically insignificant and persecuted minority. The church always did best when it was a politically insignificant and persecuted minority. And so, if the tide of, of prevailing contemporary opinion, if the tide of a godless zeitgeist has swung against the church for a little time right now, don't overreact as some on the, on the uh, evangelical side of the aisle are. Simply say, this is a sign of the times, and a little persecution, a little adversity, a little difficulty might just do the church good. Because it might actually start to mean something to take the name of Jesus and to stand in critical but loving evaluation of a culture that has lost its moral moorings. We can critique ideas. We can critique culture. We can even critique behavior. What we cannot do is judge people. That is reserved for God alone, who knows all of the genetic, epigenetic, environmental, cultural, psychological, social factors that make people what they uniquely are. And I'll tell you right now, there's going to be people on both sides of this aisle, and on both sides of this question, and on both sides of basically every question who will be saved eternally. John chapter 7, verse 24, NKJV, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is more than just right judgment. Righteous judgment hopes and believes the best. When we read a moment ago in Romans 14 that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I remind you that Jesus, being the very embodiment of love itself, believed all things, hoped all things, and endured all things. We need to believe the best about others. We need to hope the best for others. And we need to endure the worst of others. Friends, that is taking on a godly posture. It's one thing to be right in a situation. It's an entirely different thing at times to be righteous in a situation. Can somebody say amen? And I'll tell you this. If I'm reading my Bible correctly and I'm reading the ethical commitment of Scripture correctly, I think I am on that. I want to say this. God cares more about being righteous than being right. God cares more about being righteous than being right. All right, let's move to our second way here. Number one, a proud way to not humble ourselves before God is judgment of others. The second is godless planning and money-making. Let's read that. Verse 13, come now. Verse 13, come now. Some translations say, now listen. This echoes the come now, the very same phrase of chapter 5, verse 1. Come now. There are uh, some expositors of James that think that this 4.13 is the break now where James is moving. He's, he's preparing to, as it were, land the plane. That right here between 4.12 and 4.13 with, the, with these two phrases, come now or now listen, that James is going to make his two closing arguments. And so in a way, we're sort of shifting here in a, within the context of the book of James in a tectonic sense. He's not just moving on to a new idea. He's going to land the plane of his great ethical, practical, moral teaching. And what he's going to say is very interesting. Come now, verse 13, you who say, ah, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to sell. We're going to make a profit. All of this is in what's called the future indicative form. It could be translated like this, we will go, we will spend a year there, we will do business, and we will make a profit. And James goes on to say that this is arrogant. It's kind of funny, actually, because I imagine that if somebody said to you or if somebody said to me, oh, you know, I've gotten a job in, in Sydney, I've, I've been given an internship in Sydney, so I'm going to move to Sydney for the next two years, I wouldn't think, and probably you wouldn't think, how arrogant. You just think you're going to move to Sydney. How arrogant. Right? But, but what James says is really fascinating. He calls this behavior arrogant. How is this arrogant? We will go, we will spend a year there, we will do business, and we will make a profit. Because of verse 14. What you do not, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, 
For what is your life? This is the second question. The first question that James puts to us today is, who are you? Who are you to judge? Who are you to dethrone God? And the second question James puts to us, and I love it, what is your life? Let's talk about that. What is your life? Raymond A. Martin in his commentary on James says, the problem James has with such an attitude, we will go, we will do business, we will make money. The problem James has with such an attitude does not stem from the fact that these business people are following what you might call a secular vocation. That's not his concern at all. There is really no such thing as secular, but that's another story. What galls James is that such an attitude reflects a proud complacency that suggests a this-worldly planning and a blatant desire to become rich. James is not saying, oh, these are just business people that are going about ordinary business. No. It's expected of business people that they do business, whether they're making widgets or building houses or, or banking or selling life insurance, whatever it is, it's expected. Basic merchant behavior is not what's at stake here. There's no sense in Scripture in which being a merchant or being a service provider or being a provider of widgets is somehow condemned by God. In fact, it's not. Being industrious and being good with money and, and being wise with resources, that's actually praised by God. So what is it exactly here that James is critiquing? We will go. We will make money. Well, what Raymond says, what Martin says is that it's a, a, suggests a this-worldly planning and a blatant desire to become rich. James seems to have, and, and Joel and I have mentioned this several times before, how the teaching of James when it relates to the teaching of Jesus is almost atmospheric. He's soaked in the teaching of Jesus. And James sure seems to have this parable in mind, Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21. You can join me there or you can listen as I read. Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a parable beginning in verse 16. Listen to this parable and listen if you hear resonances with what we just read in James 4. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, hey, what am I going to do? What am I going to do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll do this. I will pull down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. And there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool. And God doesn't say fool in the nanny nanny boo boo sense. He doesn't say fool in the name calling sense. He says fool is in the you weren't thinking clearly sense. That's folly, mate. That's a bad choice, mate. You haven't thought things through, mate. Fool, he says. Tonight you're going to die. Now, by the way, this is not God saying I'm going to kill you for making money. That's not what he's saying. He's saying what's happening is that you didn't know that tonight is the night that that artery that you're unaware of is about ready to occlude. You're going to die tonight. You didn't know that because you hadn't been to the doctor or maybe it was before they could even do uh, an arterial examination. You, you, you didn't know. You didn't know you were going to die tonight. You fool. You didn't know you were going to die tonight. Then, after you're dead, all of this stuff, I'm paraphrasing here, all of this stuff that you've saved up, who does it go to? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In the back of, of James's critique is what we might call and what some have called, this term was, I think, coined in the mid-1950s, affluenza. A combination of the word affluent and influenza. Right? We are sick. And, and, and social commentators have said, if there is a disease that is besetting the first world countries, it's affluenza. The desire to get more, purchase more, buy more, spend more, own more. We just need more. And there's not a person in this room right now who's not convinced that if they didn't have a million bucks, that their life wouldn't be better, much better. And we've bought into that basic mentality that happiness is directly corollary with the amount of zeros in your bank account. If I had a million dollars, I'd be better off. If I had $10 million, I'd be 10 times better off. If I had $100 million, I would be 100 times better off than if I had a million and infinitely better off than I am right now because I don't have anywhere near that in my bank account. Well, why? Why would you be better off? Why? Why? Well, because uh, I could pay off my house. Okay, that's a good start. Then what? 
well, if the record, I mean, the, the, the consistent record that we have of sports stars and movie stars and others who are, and, and lottery winners who are flooded with an unexpected amount of cash or suddenly a, a large amount of cash, it doesn't usually go well for them. What would you do after you paid off your house? I'd buy a new car. What kind of a car would you buy? Well, would you buy a Honda Accord? Does a Honda Accord get you from A to B with, with you know, enough efficiency and safety? No, 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 no. You wouldn't buy a Honda Accord. You wouldn't even buy a Lexus. You wouldn't even buy, you wouldn't settle for a BMW. You would not settle for a Land Rover. You wouldn't settle for something. No, no, no. You would buy an Aston Martin. You'd buy a Bugatti. You would. You would. If you had the money, you would. You'd do. Well, maybe that's not your thing. Maybe fast cars are not your thing. Maybe it's not a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. But, but it is this. It would be some excess. And what we have seen, and we know this. I've already pointed this out in this very sermon series. Statistically, an increase in affluence correlates with a decrease in dependence on God and basic spirituality. And yet the world is that many of us live in today, we are convinced that if we just had a little more money, a newer boat, a newer car, a better house, we, our life would be better. I got news for you. It wouldn't necessarily be better. It might. If you were living in abject poverty, yes. But if you have shoes to put on your feet and a car or two to drive and a roof that doesn't leak over your house and food to eat this afternoon, you're basically there. You have arrived affluenza, got to get more, got to earn more, got to spend more, got to buy more, does not equate to I got to be more. You do not know what will happen, James says. You do not know what will happen. Oh, we're going to go to this city. We're going to be there a year. We're going to make money. And James says, you sure about that? You do not know what will happen. In Luke 12, in the parable, Jesus says, hey, what are all those barns going to do you now? What, what good are all those barns going to do you? You didn't know that tonight your artery will occlude and you'll be dead before you ever open your eyes. You didn't know that. You didn't know your body was riddled with bone cancer, did you? Now what good does the Bentley do you? Now what good does that massive portfolio do you? Now what good does that shiny new pair of shoes do you? Of course, I'm not suggesting that you can't buy a few nice things for yourselves, but the consumerist, materialist, affluenza uh, uh, culture in which we live is you've got to have more, and it's got to be better, and it's got to be shinier. We've got to keep up with the Joneses. We make, we make, we make uh, famous people who are famous for nothing else than being wealthy and famous. It's just absurd. What is your life, James asks. What is your life? Which I suppose is a good question for us today. What is your life? What is it? Well, you know what Scripture says? Scripture says it's a vapor. It's a shadow. It's grass. It's a flower. And it's smoke. Can you think of anything more ephemeral than that? Can you think of anything more impermanent than these things? Anything more transitory? Anything more fleeting than a shadow? There's my shadow. There it is. Than smoke? Than grass? The Bible makes this point again and again. Job chapter 8, verse 9. For you were born yesterday and you don't know anything because our days on earth are a shadow. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 7, the grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The people are grass. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Psalm 103, 15 and 16. Job 14, 1 and 2, man who is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Psalm 102, verse 3, for my days are consumed like smoke. When the Old Testament writers, and James here, in keeping with his Old Testament emphasis, his Old Testament ethos, he says, what is your life? And then he answers it for you. Your life is a vapor. It's a vapor. It's a blink. It's a moment. This is not, Scripture is not saying your life is therefore insignificant. That's not what Scripture is saying. If our life was insignificant, then why is God hanging on a tree to save us from our sins? No, our life is infinitely valuable to God, but what he's saying is it happens like that. It happens in a snap. It's fleeting. It's over. 
Every one of us in this room who's over the age of 50 knows this. One day you wake up, you look in the mirror, and you're like, man, I feel like I'm 16. I look like I'm 60. What happened? Am I wrong or am I right? And, and it just happens so quickly, especially after you have children, right? Am I wrong or am I right? You know, all of those little idioms and those little platitudinous sayings about how life speeds up after you have kids, they're all true. Uh, they're true. I mean, I had, it just feels like Landon was born a few days ago, and now he wants to borrow the car? I, I feel like the last 16 years have been a blink. Who can resonate with this? What parents out there can resonate with this? Of course you can. So what the Bible is saying, the Bible is not saying... Oh, your life is insignificant. Your life is meaningless. You're just like a vapor of smoke. You're just like a shadow on the ground. You're just like a blade of grass. You're just like a flower that is seasonal. The Bible is not saying you're insignificant. What the Bible is saying, you're going to blink and be 80 if you make it. So what about your big plans? What exactly are your big plans? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to go to the city. We're going to be there for a year. We're going to make some money. We're going to build bigger barns. And what if those barns are big enough? We're going to build bigger barns. Apple is the most successful and economically viable company in the world today. Steve Jobs built that company, and he is gone. Now, this is not a critique of Steve Jobs as such. I think he was one of the great geniuses of modern time. But the point is this. What good does Apple's liquidity right now, $700 billion in the bank, do Steve Jobs? The answer is nothing. Now, again, that's not a critique or a judgment on Steve Jobs as such. I hope and pray that in the, 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 the final years of Steve Jobs' life, that he came to be a, a, a humble believer in the God who can save. I hope that. But my point is this. And you can see the point. It's so obvious. We all know it. When someone dies, they don't drive their car anymore. It doesn't matter how many cars you have in the garage and how nice they are. When, you die, when you're gone, when you're, it doesn't matter how many barns you build. James says, what is your life? It's a vapor. It's a shadow. It's grass. It's a flower. It's smoke. Here in a moment, gone in an instant. Douglas Moo says, the fragility of human life and the consequent uncertainty of all human plans is the main point of this passage. I want those words to soak into your bones today. The consequent uncertainty of all human plans. So what James does not say is, therefore don't plan. Now that would be really unwise counsel. James is too smart for that and God is too smart for that. So what does he say? Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Ah. So not I'm going to, but if God wills. Proverbs 27, verse 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring forth. You don't know. You have no idea. You don't know if you'll be here next Sabbath to see Ted Wilson preach. You have no idea, and neither do I. This morning we were driving, and just for a brief moment, our car began to hydroplane. Violetta quickly regained control of the car, but what if she hadn't? I wouldn't even be here to preach this sermon. If the Lord wills, James says, rather than saying, we will go to town, and we're going to do business, and we're going to make a profit, what James says is, not don't plan, and James has no problem with making money, by the way. You can make money. Jesus doesn't mind if you make money. We want you to be industrious. But what's the point of making money? What's the point? So what James says is, say this instead, if the Lord wills then we'll do thus and so. I've put it to you this way. If the Lord wills is not a formula. I mean, can you imagine if if we suddenly took this too over uh, 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 literally? Be like, hey, you guys want to come over for lunch? If the Lord wills, I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'm just going to go use the restroom, and if the Lord wills, I'll be back. If the Lord wills, no, 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 he's not saying before every proposition, however small and however seemingly insignificant, make sure you say the Lord wills or you're being disobedient. That's not what he's saying. If the Lord wills is not a formula, but in, what's that word there? What's that word there, everybody? It's an attitude and an, what's the next word? And it's a word, let's say those two words together. It's an attitude and an awareness of two things, God's sovereignty and of our own fragility. Nothing wrong with planning, but make sure you bathe those plans in two crucially important realities. Number one, 
God is God. And number two, you are smoke. You are grass. You are a vapor. You are a shadow. Bathe that in those two realities. Two proud ways, judgment of others and godless planning and money making. In each of these cases, God is removed from being God, if only a little. When we stand in judgment of others, we're taking God off the throne and saying, I'll take over from here. And when we make plans without saying, if God wills, we're saying, I know the future. I know what's going to happen. And God says, I'm sorry, you are not in possession of what will happen tomorrow. This is why Jesus said, don't even worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You worry about today. Someone has wisely commented that today is all you have and it's a gift. That's why it's called the present. Who are you and what is your life? I want to tell you, you can go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right in four months. And you might be lucky to get that long. You can go from being alive and having all kinds of plans to not waking up in the morning. And this church has been the sad, tragic witness to that reality in in the recent loss of one of our brightest and best members here, David North. Yesterday, I spent time writing an article. An article for a secular fishing magazine. The, the magazine is called Fish and Game New Zealand. And my friend Martin, who is in both of these pictures, was a painter and an illustrator and a regular writer and contributor and photographer to Fish and Game. Every time we went on a trip from 2007 to the present, 2006 to the present, Martin would write up our adventures and, and there would be pictures and sometimes cover photographs and stories about our adventures. Our adventures, it was just thrilling to get those magazines, all of which I still have in my possession of me on the cover or a picture that I took of Martin on the cover and of these stories that were our lives. And the last trip that we just took in 2015, also with David North, the three of us, Martin Simpson, David Asherick, and David North was a trip that exceeded all of our wildest expectations about how good a fishing trip could be. We had had amazing trips before, trips that were so good they were featured in magazines. But this trip was beyond what we could have ever hoped and dreamed. And not long after Martin returned, after we returned, Martin was, we knew he had prostate cancer, but his prostate cancer had gotten into his bones. And he began to go downhill very rapidly. And he wanted to write this article about our trip, this amazing trip, this epic trip. And he called it the last trip, and he started making notes. And uh, on December 3rd, 2016, before he could write the article, he died. He tried to write it, but he just got too weak. He just got, he just couldn't. And so I have been in contact with the magazine that he used to be a contributor for, and I reached out to them several months ago. They reached out to me. It was sort of a mutual thing, and I said, hey, look, um, I'll write that article about our last trip that Martin had begun if you want me to. And the editor, Hamish, responded and said, please, we would love to have that article. And I said, it will be kind of half about fishing and the other half about friendship. When Martin passed away on December 3rd, David and I were both understandably devastated, and we would say things like this, we've got to go back to those rivers again and go fish them and just remember Martin. And I'd say, yeah, we need to do that. This year's a little busy. 20, 2017's, uh, 2016's a little busy, but, but maybe 2017, maybe 2018. Let's do 2018. Yeah, 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 that's what we'll do. We'll do it, we'll do it early in 2018. February, March, we'll get over there. We'll go on those, some of those same rivers, and yeah, that's what we'll do until July 25th. when David didn't wake up. He had every intention of waking up. Martin had no intention of getting cancer. But their lives are like smoke. They're like vapors. They're like grass. They're like flowers. And by this, God is not saying your life is insignificant and meaningless. What God is saying is, be careful how you plan. Be careful how you treat others because it will be over in a moment. And for many of us, it will be over before we imagine. So James says, don't say, I'm going to do thus and so. Say this, if the Lord wills, I will do this by His grace and by His power. Ever bearing in mind these two great realities, human frailty and human fragility, and God's sovereignty. 
Now, there is a happy ending to this story. Not a sad story. This is not a sad story. This is a happy story. Because David's going to wake up quite unaware of what happened. And he's going to be absolutely thrilled with the fact that he is saved in eternity. And Martin, who knew that his death was coming, who knew it was happening, these are really the two ways to die. You can die in a car accident in a moment, or you can know with cancer that over time you can be preparing yourself. I remember when I went and visited Martin and, and took these photos of him, I said to him, Martin, and, you know, because we knew his time was very short, I said, um, now that you've come to the very, very end, and barring an absolute miracle, your days are numbered, how would you prefer to die? Would you have preferred to have died in a moment and be unaware of it, or would you have preferred over a year to have known and to see it coming? And he said, oh, I would have much preferred to die like this. He said, I, I, I've had every conversation I wanted to have with my son and my daughter. I've had every conversation that I've wanted to have. I, I, I had all of that, and now, even though I don't want to die, I want to go fishing. I want to go running. I want to go walking, but I'm ready to die. And you might get blessed. Your vapor, your flower, your grass might end like that, and it might not. You might hydroplane and be gone in a moment. And this is not designed to scare us. We all know we're going to die, so there's no point in trying to scare somebody about their own death. We know that. But what it should do is help us to take on board what James is saying. Because of your own frailty, because of your own mortality, because of your own fragility, be careful how you treat others. And because of your own frailty and fragility, be careful about the plans that you're making. What plans are you making? What matters most? Today I leave you, or I should say James leaves us all, with two questions. Who are you and what is your life? Father in heaven, we are humbled today before Scripture because Scripture has that inimitable way of putting the finger of the Spirit right on our hearts. Father, you know us, you see us intimately. Father, you know where this message fits each one of us. You know where this situation fits us, Father. There's, there's not a person in this room that some aspect or large aspects of this message does not fit. But, Father, you can make application by the Spirit. And, Father, I pray that going out of here, we would just have a freedom, a strong sense, not of a fear of death. Father, why should we be afraid of death? Jesus is raised from the grave. But a strong sense that it is incumbent upon us to let you be God and to let you be the judge and to let you be the sovereign and Father, in this smoky, vaporous, grassy existence that we have, may we major in the majors. May we spend our time, our energies, and our resources on what matters most is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all of God's vapors, let all of God's grass, let all of God's flowers and smoke say, Amen.